industry, the trade union, the pension fund, the insurance company, the radio, the television, the newspapers, the bank and even the police. Person fell sick, the family took care of her. When a person grew old, the family supported her, and her children were her pension fund. When a person died, the family took care of the orphans. If a person wanted to build a hut, the family lent a hand. If a person wanted to open a business, the family raised the necessary money. If a person wanted to marry, the family chose, or at least vetted, the prospective spouse. If conflict arose with a neighbor, the family muscled in. But if a person's illness was too grave for the family to manage, or a new business demanded too large an investment, or the neighborhood quarrel escalated to the point of violence, the local community came to the rescue. The community offered help on the basis of local traditions and an economy of favors, which often differed greatly from the supply and demand laws of the free market. In an old-fashioned medieval community, when my neighbor was in need, I helped build his hut and sheep without expecting any payment in return. When I was in need, my neighbor returned the favor. At the same time, the local potentate might have drafted all of us villagers to construct his castle without paying us a penny. In exchange, we counted on him to defend us against brigands and brigands. Village life involved many transactions but few payments. There were some markets, of course, but their roles were limited. You could buy rare spices, cloth and tools, and hire the services of lawyers and doctors. Yet less than 10% of commonly used products and services were bought in the market. Most human needs were taken care of the family and the community. There were also kingdoms and empires that performed important tasks such as waging wars, building, and constructing palaces. For these purposes kings raised taxes and occasionally enlisted soldiers and laborers. Yet, with few exceptions, they tended to stay out of the daily affairs of families and communities. Even if they wanted to intervene, most kings could do so only with difficulty. Traditional cultural economies had few surpluses with which to feed crowds of government officials, policemen, social workers, teachers, and doctors. Consequently, most rulers did not develop mass welfare systems, healthcare systems, or educational systems. They left matters in the hands of families and communities. Even on rare occasions when rulers tried to intervene more intensively in the daily lives of the peasantry, as happened, for example, in the Qin Empire in China, they did so by converting family heads and community elders into government agents. Enough transportation and communication difficulties made it so difficult to intervene in the affairs of remote communities that many kingdoms preferred to cede even the most basic royal prerogatives, such as taxation and violence, to communities. The Ottoman Empire, for instance, allowed family is to meet out justice, rather than supporting a large imperial police force. If my cousin killed somebody, the victim's brother might kill me and sanction the Sultan in Istanbul or even the provincial Pasha did not intervene in such clashes, as long as violence remained within acceptable limits. In the Chinese Ming Empire, 1368-1644, the population was organized into the Beijia system. Ten families were grouped to form a Jia, and ten Jia constituted a Bao. When a member committed a crime, other Bao members could be punished for it, in particular the Bao elders. Taxes too were levied on the Bao, 
and it was the responsibility of the Bell elders rather than of the officials to assess the situation of each family and determine the amount of tax it should pay. From the Empire's perspective, this system had a huge advantage. Instead of maintaining thousands of revenue officials and tax collectors, who would have to monitor the earnings and expenses of every family, these tasks were left to the community elders. The elders knew how much each villager was worth and they could usually enforce tax payments without involving the imperial army. Many kingdoms and empires were in truth little more than large protection rackets. The king was the capo di tutti copy who collected action money and in return made sure that neighboring crime syndicates and local small fry did not harm those under his protection. He did little else. In the bosom of family and community was far from ideal. Families and communities could oppress their members no less brutally than do modern states and market. And their internal dynamics were often fraught with tension and violence, yet people had little choice. A person who lost her family and community around 1750 was as good as dead. She had no job, no education, and no support in times of sickness and distress. Nobody would loan her money or defend. She got into trouble. There were no policemen, no social workers, and no compulsory education. In order to survive, such a person quickly had to find an alternative family or community. Boys and girls who ran away from home could expect at best, to become servants in some new family. At worst, there was the or the brothel. All this changed dramatically over the last two centuries. The Industrial Revolution gave the market immense new powers, provided the state with new means of communication and transportation, and placed at the government's disposal an army of clerks, teachers, and social workers. At first the market and the stat discovered their path blocked by traditional families and communities who had little love for outside intervention. Parents and community elders were reluctant to let the younger generation be indoctrinated by nationalist education system, conscripted into armies or turned into a rootless urban proletariat. Over time, States and markets used their growing power to weaken the traditional of family and community. The state sent its police.